So good morning and welcome to another live session in the meanwhile six uh, knowledge management MOOC. This time it will be in English because we have an international and I would say rather glorious audience today, which is surely due to our speaker today, Peter Pavlovsky, who is a big name in uh, knowledge management. So one of the founder of the German Society of Knowledge Management one of the founder of, I think it, it has been the first master um, studies on knowledge management in Germany. So, but Peter, I think you will also shortly introduce yourself. And as I know that uh, we treat a big topic uh, today, I will stop here and the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much, Gabriela for having me here and uh, for introducing me as a big name. You know, that's, that's my day, obviously. Uh, thanks a lot. That's uh, too much of a credit. But um, I'd like to thank you and uh, especially also you and Dirk for having uh, me here and for working together. We've been working together for quite some time in knowledge management. And I'd like to congratulate you for this initiative because I think it's really a important and a good grassroots development or movement, which uh, gives people the opportunity to learn from experiences in knowledge management in a very informal way. And I think this is exactly what knowledge management is about, learning from each other and, uh, and sharing knowledge. So let me just, uh, you asked me to introduce myself shortly. My name is Peter Pavlovsky. I've had a chair for personnel management and leadership studies at the Chemnitz University of Technology for 26 years. And now I'm senior research professor for team and knowledge management. And uh, it gives me the opportunity to do all the nice things in life, uh, research and talks like this, uh, without having any university bureaucracy in my neck. Uh, so this is a real, uh, very pleasant situation and uh, I enjoy uh, disseminating this type of knowledge in, in talks. So um, the idea here of this uh, contribution here is to give you a subjective narrative based on 40 years of research in knowledge management and intellectual capital management. And I would like to pronounce that it's such a subjective narrative. It's a high altitude perspective with a low scientific granularity going into detail. But on the other side, it gives the possibility to draw a big picture looking at the development from our field from a bird's view. But it's subjective, of course. So like 30, 40 years covering 30, 40 years of knowledge management history is very subjective and very partially and very um, selective. So uh, please uh, excuse me for omitting some parts uh, and many parts, obviously, and uh, looking at some aspects which I pronounce and find uh, are important. So I'd like to give a short reference to uh, the team uh, that was involved in, in this whole research part, especially to uh, Stephanie Tietz and Nina Flugfelder, two PhD students of mine at my institute. Nina Flugfelder, she passed the crossing line with her PhD end of last year and Stephanie Tietz, she's almost finished. She will probably be finished the first quarter of this year. So I'd like to also mention their reference and I will take up their names, especially with those things they've been, they've been contributing to. So the EVA overview, my name, the name of the, um, of the contribution is from knowledge distribution to knowledge sharing, which in my view sort of gives a spectrum of developments and I'd like to pronounce why. And the question is knowledge management, where are you coming from and where are you heading to? So KM, Undevenis and Quo Vadis. And I'd like to cover three phases, the past, the present and the future. So in the past, I will take up and like to uh, propose six phases of knowledge management, which of course, as I said before, are not completely covering what happened in these phases, but which try to focus on very important developments, which I find um, you can also make a distinction in these phases. So that's basically the most important aspect um, having a distinction between the phases, what has developed in these phases, what was special for these phases. The second point is then the uh, present, looking at the bibliometric overview of knowledge management in, in the present and trying to discover sort of certain clusters and fields and connections, what is going on there, a very short glimpse only. And the third part is 
looking at some topics which I personally uh, think will be of uh, major importance in the coming future or which are already important but which will grow in importance. So let's start off with the past, with the development phases, uh, KM, knowledge management, undevenis, where are you coming from? So this is a very personal history. When I started studying organizational learning and knowledge management uh, in the 80s, I ran into knowledge management in the context of organizational learning. And this to me is basically the, the or pronounces or shapes the roots of knowledge management also, this research on organizational learning. So let's jump back into the 70s, which was before I started looking at organizational learning. And uh, I'd like to give you a small example in this uh, phase. Maybe some of you remember that you could drive bicycle on a German motorway in the 70s and 73, in fall of 73, to be precise. And um, this uh, actually, most of you won't remember it, but this actually was not due to a natural scarcity of oil, but was in response to the American decision to support Israel during the Yom Kippur War. And as a result, in October 73, the members of the, of the OPEC Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, they imposed an oil embargo on the Western world and the Western world suddenly had to cope with a drastic oil shortage. Okay, so what's that got to do with knowledge management? It's sort of a history, a teaser maybe, but I think it's important what this crisis resulted in because for money, companies, this was not so amusing, the oil embargo, the oil price shock. It led to a market collapse and to a deep economic crisis, one of the uh, strongest or most severe crises after the Second World War. And a large number of companies were caught up in this swirl and many companies went bankrupt then. So if we look at the bankruptcies in small and medium sized companies in Germany in this phase, we see a very, very sharp increase in bankruptcies in 73 or to be precise, directly after 73. Now, the point was this the crisis came without warning and caught many companies completely off guard. And now there's a story. <laughs> Uh, from the Royal Dutch Shell. It, this is storytelling, it's not uh, sort of scientific evidence, but um, I'd like to uh, to incorporate this story because uh, for me, it marks a very important historical development in knowledge management. So uh, a young manager by the name of Ari de Goyes, who was corporate planning director, together with Pierre Back and Graeme Gala, um, they were all influenced by Hermann Kahn, who was doing research and experimenting with scenario techniques at the RAND Corporation since his 50s. They were going into scenario planning techniques and they introduced this method of scenario learning at the Royal Dutch Shell. So more or less about uh, since the end of the 60s, they implemented regular scenario planning workshops at Shell at the top management level. So, you know, they went offsite somewhere uh, with top management and then they post some scenarios which the members of the top management had to develop. For example, what would happen if oil supplies would completely slump tomorrow? And, uh, you know, the, the members and the, the participants uh, laughed uh, and um, then they joined in on this scenario development over the weekend. So the important thing was that after the oil crisis, the Royal Dutch Shell uh, had done exceptionally well compared to its competitors. It moved somewhere from ranking six to ranking four in the international uh, in the in international list of competitors of oil producing con uh, companies. And whether this was a fact to the implementation of scenario planning, of course, cannot be proven or cannot even be stated scientifically. But it's interesting, and many observers including Graeme K. Gaylor, who was part of that team, scenario planning team at the Royal Dutch Shell, with whom I had a chance to work with in a project of the uh, Daimler-Benz Foundation. And he attributed the internal flexibility of top management to the internal reflexivity of top management's mental models. You know, they were able to cope with very, very different environmental scenarios and possibly they were much faster than others to react because they had been experimenting with scenario planning with completely different, different environmental developments. 
So at the very least, one can say that this severe crisis was a clear turning point with regard to companies' outlook and the necessity to learn from changing environments. So it's very easily very easily shown uh, with this uh, quotation from Ari de Goyce, which one of the most quoted uh, sentences in, in PhDs or in, in master thesis uh, when it comes to organizational learning. What he said was the ability to learn faster than your competitors may be the only sustainable competitive advantage. Now, this, this was new. You know, this was new indeed because questioning the widespread of long range planning and understanding the instability and complexity of business environments was completely new at that in that time. What we had observed or what can be observed if you look at the organizational theory that had been um, developed and uh, that was uh, discussed in research, we see that a number uh, that a number of perceptions or a number of concepts developed, for example, Duncan, Emery Trist, Lawrence Lorsch, Anz of Child, and so on. They spoke about turbulent fields in the environment of organizations or environmental turbulence or dynamic environments. And this certainly were the predecessors of our VUCA world that we speak about today. So with regard to organization theory, here organizations were conceptualized as systems that carry out decision-making process in a very, very turbulent environment at that time, turbulent, because long range planning was, as we saw, wasn't possible same, to the same degree as before. And then from this absorption and processing of information from the environment, they derived decisions. And one of the most, or the, possibly the first, and one of the most prominent models was the model by Syrett and March, who had been influenced from behavioristic thinking in psychology, and they, they transferred this concept to uh, organizational domain, into the organizational domain, and they spoke about the so-called standard operating procedures. So this model you see down here was basically built upon a stimulus of the environment that somehow influenced the organization, and the organization has certain ways of dealing with it in its internal memory. And those are the standard operating procedures. It has, for example, decision rules, it has certain attention rules. It has certain search rules. You know, those are standard operating procedures that the, the organization deals with stimuli coming from the environment. And from this perception, this certainly was the case in, in Sarit March model, that organizations learn when they cope with different stimuli in the environment, and then they react to it. And accordingly, they change their standard operating procedures when they have learned that they have to react in a different way. And they change their internal memory systems. So basically, from this behavioristic stimulus response model, we have a big tradition, cognitive tradition that evolved. So we have many, many models that address the topic of organizational knowledge systems. And this was a broad basis for knowledge management in the late 60s until the 80s. So we have, for example, I mean, this is a long list, which you hardly see on the, on the slide. But we have concepts of organizational theory. We have concepts of organizational intelligence from Wilensky and Oberschulte. We have organizational frames of reference. And we have organizational mind, just to give some examples. And these perceptions all see organization knowledge as something the organization has above the individual knowledge and uh, the individual memory. And these knowledge systems somehow change. These uh, systems adapt and can be altered or influenced by learning. So to me, organizational learning and knowledge management are two sides of a coin that define the roots of knowledge management. You know, you have this learning necessity through environmental changes, and then knowledge is an important asset by which you react to changing environments. So from here, we can move to the second phase, which I call job demand perspective. It was possibly sometime between 80s and 2000. And knowledge management here is understood as an approach to provide the necessary knowledge to fulfill the job requirements and demands of an organization. So it was purely functional. 
you know, what we need, we have to uh, get, and we define what we need by job demands. So we see one early definition of knowledge management by Odell and others who say that knowledge management is therefore a conscious strategy of getting the right knowledge to the right people at the right time and helping people share and put information into action in ways that strive to improve organizational performance. So what we see here is a clearly demand-oriented perspective. You look at the organizational demand. We see this in the slide here. You have certain markets, you have customers, you have an organization with certain strategies, with certain technology, with certain work organization. And from these demands, you derive a model of adapting the human potential through further training, through, through knowledge management, to, uh, to the demands of the organization. So the target perspective in these models was to adapt the knowledge of the employees to the given requirements of the job, nothing more, or the work system. Uh, but at least uh, the job or the work systems were the prerequisites which you adapted the human potential to. So any redundant knowledge, learning or know-how that people had, apart from the required qualification, did not play any role and did not have any space in these concepts. So one example is here is a Plenske skill model. So you have a skill radar here, and in these radars, you have a target skill that you have to adapt to, and you have the current skill of the employee, and these have to be matched. So this was basically the outlook of how you adapt the knowledge in the organization to the requirements of certain jobs and of certain work systems. Another important development in this phase were the, was the development of so-called process models of knowledge management. And uh, we see that there were a number of process models developed which were all derived from basically cybernetic control loop thinking, which was uh, very prominent in communication theory and which were, also came into, into uh, organizational theory. And we see models like Mandel, uh, like Nonaka, like Probst, like Boiseau, like Epler, Reinman Rothmeier, myself, I developed a model in 92. And these models basically had the concern to identify to generate, to share, to organize, and to store knowledge in the organization, and to use it with respect to organizational goals. Now, we have a slight change in perspective. So, quasi for the first time, we see that collective knowledge related to organization goals and strategies is important. So, maybe you remember the Probst model, where he has the process phases of knowledge management, and he takes the goals of the organization outside of this model and says it's necessary first to define the organizational knowledge goals and then you can go through the loops of adapting knowledge and using knowledge, storing knowledge in the organization. So this is exactly, I think, where the phase three starts, where we have the question, okay, we need knowledge in organizations, we need it in order to cope with environments and we need the right organization at the right place. And basically, this is still defined on the basis of work systems, of workplaces, and starting now, organizational prerequisite strategies and so on. So from the mid of the 90s, we witness a professionalization and primarily technology-oriented approaches to knowledge management. So here we have skill management systems, knowledge distribution was increasingly supported with IT tools at this time. So we have concepts of knowledge engineering, of platforms, of yellow pages, of skill management systems, and so on. So the basic understanding here is that knowledge is explicit, is accessible, and countable, and that it is important that knowledge contributes to organizational performance. So let me give you an example. The focus in large organizations, for example, Airbus or Volkswagen, which I had a chance to work together with at that time, almost exclusively concentrated on knowledge which is identified and managed along a value chain. So uh, we have this model from the Fraunhofer Institute here in Germany, where you have a process chain or a business process chain, which you add knowledge to. So knowledge here, represents a resource, a resource 
which similar to a natural raw material or preliminary product is transported to the relevant operational processing station in order to support the value creation process. So you have knowledge which is derived from these stations, you know, which uh, results from using certain tools or something in these process stations, and then this knowledge can be stored. But you also have this knowledge as an input into these stations. So it is clearly oriented towards explicit, accessible, and countable knowledge. It's something you can easily transfer and, and adapt. Another example at this time was the development in uh, Volkswagen. Uh, we have a department which uh, called itself WWDECK, Vividec. They didn't want to call themselves Department for Knowledge Management, but basically this was what, uh, what it was. It was a Department for Knowledge Management. In peak times, I think it's uh, somewhere around 30 people worked in this department. And Vividec stands for Worldwide Development and Exchange of Corporate Knowledge. It was much more fancy, you know, it was fancier to call themselves development uh, and, and exchange of corporate uh, organizational knowledge, the knowledge management department. So under this abbreviation, highly creative tools were developed at that time, which we still use today in knowledge management, which were sort of core of the de development of internal knowledge management tools like yellow pages or community networks or knowledge relays, you know, to, to give knowledge uh, to the, the next uh, uh, person in a job. Um, just to name some of the successful uh, tools. Now, just let me make a small remark at this, uh, at this point, a small remark, because interestingly enough, I worked for another Volkswagen company uh, many years later, and they wanted to uh, introduce some type of knowledge management. It was a motor factory. And um, we made a small project, and I introduced them to, to these tools that uh, Volkswagen had developed, and there was no memory whatsoever. They hadn't a slight clue that these tools had been developed internally. So, so much for organizational storage of knowledge. This was completely lost. But that's just a little side remark, how important it is to store the uh, knowledge, uh, especially knowledge which is important for the organization, obviously. Now, in uh, parallel to these practical advancements, in this phase, in the third phase, we have a renaissance of knowledge valuation attempts. So the question arose much more, how can we value knowledge? What is the worth in the knowledge evaluation? So these attempts or these concepts build, build on uh, human resource accounting. Now Likert had worked with knowledge or human resource accounting in the 60s already. And then new attempts were made in the 90s to specify the value of knowledge. And an important trigger of this knowledge valuation movement, one can say, was the EU project Ricardis. Its aim was to support innovation by measuring and reporting of knowledge in small and medium-sized companies. And, uh, for example, Günter Koch and uh, Leif Edmondson were part of these projects. And uh, these, this was created a large momentum. And maybe not the results of Ricardis, the practical results were so important, but much more that people came together and worked on, on certain questions and continued working after the Ricardis project on, uh, on these questions. So Ricardis caused a momentum, in my view. One was the intellectual capital accounting approach, which was anchored around the University of Ferrara, basically around the person of Stefano Sambon. And his intention, or this group's intention, was basically to quantify and analyze annual reports to, with regard to organizational intellectual capital. And earlier, Leif Edmondson had developed a pioneering idea, which is very prominent in intellectual capital management, uh, his concepts of the Scandia Navigator, where he developed a notion that human capital and structural capital, if you add those, you have the intellectual capital concept. So he based it on the balance scorecard from Kaplan and Norton, and he developed a model which differentiates between financial focus, customer focus, human focus, process focus, and renewal focus. And this was maybe the most important thing, the renewal focus, because the question was, what knowledge and what learning capabilities does an organization have in order to renew itself? 
And this was considered as something that you could evaluate and something that you could value the organization by. So this was one line or one momentum that the Ricardis project led to. And I think the second momentum, again with Leif, who was a pioneer in all of this thinking, was a grouping around the three founders of the new Club of, of Paris, Leif, Edvinson, Ahmed Bonfour, and uh, the former CEO of the biggest Austrian research organization, Günter Koch. By the, by the way, Ahmed was the first, uh, had the first uh, chair for, for international knowledge economy in France, in Paris. Now, these three, following the idea of the Club of Rome, uh, founded the new Club of Paris in 2006 um, with the aim to support nations, regions, cities, communities, and organizations in their transformation into the knowledge society. And if you look at the homepage today, this is basically the outlook of the club's perspective and focus today. So this led to a large dissemination and development of knowledge management thinking in different aspects for years to come. So there was a close cooperation with the World Bank in Paris, and we had annual meetings in, in Paris uh, with great food, by, by the way. Uh, but the important thing was that the World Bank also followed this line and development in their so-called knowledge assessment methodology. So what did the World Bank do? They developed a methodology. And the idea was to track the development of all OECD countries towards a knowledge and information society. You know, we all know that uh, the gross domestic product, the GDP, is faultly in many ways. You know, every accident on the highway increases the uh, GDP. But the idea was here to question what indicators do we need in order to track societies economy's development to, towards a knowledge society, which was considered as a clear goal. So uh, they developed new indicators with a lot of discussions, you know, how can we measure knowledge development in a national economy? And of course, these indicators had importance also for organizational measurement. But numerous national and international products evolved that analyzed benefits of intangible assets, not only in organizations, but also cities, regions and countries. So questions like, what return does it give you if you invest in education, in schools, universities, and so on, and research institutes, and so on. So this also had some results in Germany, because a project was developed, or one could say maybe a large, a large program was developed from the German Ministry of Economics, the BMBE, which and had been sensitized to this discussion, and they developed a program called Fit für den Wissenswettbewerb, Fit for Knowledge Competition Program, Consortium. And this was a, quite a large consortium of projects that all developed different aspects of the question, how can a competi competitive advantage be developed in small and medium-sized companies by introducing knowledge management and by using knowledge management tools. Now. This is very interesting because the original intention from the ministry was to give companies empirical evidence for the value of their intangible capital for loan and credit negotiations with their banks. You know, they wanted to give banks an opportunity to evaluate the intellectual capital of companies and thereby assess sort of their, their credibility. But this never worked out in no way. But the implementation of the intellectual capital reporting that small and medium sized companies had to do in advance, and they had to develop an intangible balance sheet, this preparation was a really a strategic development process, which was very important. So based on Edvinson and Malone's and Scania's Navigator and Koch's intellectual capital statement, these intellectual capital statements were advanced by a program called the Arbeitskreis Wissensbilanz or Wissensbilanz made in Germany, which was a tool that was developed in order to assess this intellectual capital and the uh, knowledge of a company. And for example, Manfred Bornem and Kai Albert, Markus Will, who are all part of this, uh, this working group, Wissensbilanz, they strongly developed and moved this, this perspective further and are working with these tools up to today in a very focused way. 
So it was not so much about valuing intangible capital or directing knowledge to a one-to-one -to, -one to the right place in the organization. It was much more about the insight of knowledge's importance. So I frequently participated in these workshops, in these IC valuation workshops with CEOs from small and medium-sized companies. And it was stunning to see how it suddenly became clear to many people participating there, especially CEOs, how close and how deeply involved their strategy development was connected to intangible resources and human capital, in other words, to knowledge and knowledge management. So based on Edvinson and Malone, Scania Navigator and Koch's intellectual capital statement, the intellectual capital statement topic was advanced very strongly in this phase. But the second development here we should also mention because it was extremely important to the development, to today's development of knowledge management, it was that it became more and more clear or accentuated that not least by the book of Nonaka and Takeuchi on knowledge uh, generation in, in organizations and knowledge development in orga organizations. And the question here came up, what actually is the knowledge strategy of an organization? How can it be developed? And here, I think for the first time, we had a discussion where the limitations of a simplistic rational objective model, sort of IT-based storing of information and knowledge, and then you take it when you need it, became apparent. And also here we have the discussion of Ursula Schneider's management of ignorance in this context. And in my view, it can be generalized from this phase that knowledge management in the sense of a reflexive management requires a dialogue culture in which people reflect on assumptions, learn together, experience together, experience uh, failures and successes together. And this model of Nonaka uh, with these four phases makes it quite clear that knowledge development is a spiral, is a process, is something that people shape and develop together uh, by dialogues and by experiment, by experiencing things together. And this becomes more and more important as we go along in the historical development. I'd like just shortly to mention two institutional points or steps in this area. One was the development of the first executive master program in knowledge management that we did at the Technical University of Chemnitz. And this program was a part-time program for executives of German companies and involved sort of the transfer of knowledge management capabilities, tools, and experiences. This was a quite an interesting development. And the second point was the founding of the German Society for Knowledge Management, the GFVM, which is now strongly has strongly developed. When we founded that in, in 2000, uh, there were just a couple of people, I think eight people that were together founding it at the Daimler-Benz Collect, but now it has developed to quite an uh, impact and focus organization and institution in knowledge management in Germany. Now, at the turn of the millennium, I'd like to uh, address the fourth phase, which I think differentiates from the third one in a significant way. Because here, the complexity and turbulence of environments increased even more. So now we're speaking of a VUCA world, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, as you all know. We're speaking of a VUCA world. And here, the resource knowledge became a very pr prominent potential competitive factor. Something that Barton, uh, Leonard Barton, coined as core knowledge or core capabilities and core competencies of an organization, to have the right word. She named it core competencies. And it became increasingly clear that it is the specific core competency of an organization that leads to a strategic competitive advantage. So we have Leonard Barton with core competencies. We have Hamel and Prahlad with competitive advantages which were formed into a step-by-step step step crafting strategy in the sense of Minsberg. It's something that had to develop in an organization. It's not there by saying, this is our strategy. It's something you have to craft and develop. So knowledge here was much more the result of a specific collective learning history. If we uh, make a small bracket, if we uh, speak in, in a bracket, we can say Barney had coined the term causal ambiguity in 91 already. 
saying that knowledge is a result of a series of interaction processes by the members of the organization. By people learning together, interacting, sharing knowledge, they, de uh, they, they developed a collective learning history. And this causal ambiguity cannot be transferred easily, cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, bought by uh, another company uh, or cannot be used externally. So this is a very specific learning history and the specificity and value of knowledge cannot easily be copied and transferred to other to other organizations so this is something that shapes the core capabilities and core competencies of an organization and these influences sharpen the insight in the community that knowledge management does not just involve distributing exchanging knowledge explicit knowledge to certain points of reference to certain uh, jobs or to certain work systems but that it has to be constructed, has to be developed, has to be communicated again and again and again in an organizational learning culture. This is a very interactive process. And I'd like to mention a short study that we did in this phase. Uh, we had the opportunity to, um, to make a large representative study in Germany with 3,400 companies, representative companies for German economy small and medium-sized companies as well as large companies and we questioned their corporate strategy their knowledge management activities we developed the knowledge management index and their company performance now i'd like i'm mentioning this study because in my knowledge this is uh, the largest study that has been made on this and that it gives some clear evidence on the effects of knowledge management in organizations even though we're not speaking of a causal relation but in, in any case i will argue that this is a pretty good matching model a structural equation which answers partly the question of knowledge management's influence and performance so we have knowledge management we operationalize it with uh, over 70 indicators and we find that there are these four elements diffusion identification action integration uh, and modification of knowledge so this is a clear model that clusters around knowledge management and then we looked at the strategies, uh, organizational strategies, and we looked at the performance. And I'd just like to go shortly go into the performance uh, side of the model, because here we're looking at innovate, innovation ma uh, measured by process and uh, product uh, uh, innovation. We look at motivation of the employees uh, measured by productive energy concept developed by Heike Bruch. And we use part of her scale in order to operationalize the internal motivation of the of the uh, employees. Then we have market performance, which was measured with traditional scales. And what maybe is most important, we measured financial performance with uh, Basel II indicators that the banks used in order to assess company performance at that time, uh, the Basel II indicators which were clearly oriented towards past financial performance. So we used all of these indicators to measure the performance of the organization. And you see that there is a very clear connection between knowledge management activities and organizational performance. And this was the best fit in the structural equation model based on 3,400 cases. So I think it's, it's quite a good uh, result that one at least can argue that it's quite plausible that knowledge management is linked to corporate success. And the question of whether how and how much knowledge management is practiced depends very much on corporate strategies. So I'd like to jump into the next phase. No, we're still in phase uh, four with the competitiveness, the strategic management and the experimental lo uh, logics. And here we have an important development uh, which uh, popularized knowledge management, that was clearly Peter Seng's fifth discipline. He um, distinguished or he differentiated uh, five disciplines, personal empowerment, mental models, shared visions, team learning, and systemic thinking. And taking up the second one, mental models, which is nothing else than shared knowledge systems that people in organizations have. So, and he complements those five disciplines with a diversity of methods and tools such as dialogue and communicative learning. He published this tool book, which I find is extremely helpful for organizational interventions and implementation of knowledge management. And all of this makes clear knowledge is a common process of sense making and interpretation in organization, 
which is about developing a common cultural basis and action orientation in organizations in, connect, in connection with strategic and systemic leadership. So here we have the results of sort of this implicit development and this interactive development, constructing knowledge in organizations and, and leading it and focusing it on organizational goals and thereby gaining momentum in order to use knowledge management for performance. So knowledge as a classic rational resource is supplemented here by a subjective meaning of the, of the participants and to speak with rockage of terminal values that the participants of organizations have. And obviously also of emotional connections. And it becomes clear that organization knowledge is far more than the sum of the individual knowledge that the people in an organization have. So Sanger, and here I have a little picture of a helicopter view. Sanger mentions the, uh, the importance of a helicopter view in his ladder of inference detaching oneself from one's point of view and looking at the whole and questioning one's own assumptions together with others. So together with, with Bohm, with David Bohm, he, uh, he um, advocated the method of dialogues, which is extremely powerful in teams because in a dialogue, you don't have to defend your standpoint, uh, your uh, concept, you just add with others. You try to add meaning, first of all, trying to get the big picture, trying to understand where you are, where you're um, involved in. And then uh, this is much more helpful because it helps to, uh, to broaden the view and to understand the complexity of environments and of organizations. And we use this concept in our master uh, program uh, quite a lot and people were so eased because I said, oh, it's wonderful sitting together with others, not having to defending one's standpoints, defending one's notion, discussing because, you know, from, from Greek discussion is based on, uh, on destroying and dialogue is uh, building together, building uh, notions. And um, interestingly enough, Nonaka has the concept or developed the concept of ba, and uh, which is very similar. In ba, you also have a room where you add meaning, where you add different angles, perspectives, and so on. And um, when I was in Japan as a guest professor in the JAST, I asked Nonaka, and of course he had uh, witnessed the uh, development of the uh, helicopter view concept from or in the dialogue from David Bohm, but they, they were not referenced to each other. And this, I think, are true, very true uh, concepts that help to develop joint meaning in organizations. And here too, we have a shared knowledge space we have uh, learning communities, we have collaborative learning evolving from these perspectives. And so, for example, Paul Iskus knowledge spaces develops and he shows that, you know, these bars and these helicopter views can occur in very, very different environments and in very different uh, contexts. So from here, we can see a shift from pure distributing knowledge to a sharing of knowledge. And here we are in, fi in uh, phase five which I'd like to label from distributing of knowledge to knowledge sharing. So what was the begin, beginning of this phase or what was the main trigger? In my view, there was a widespread availability and mobile access of the internet and social media, which started in this period. So this was not at least driven by the effects of the Arab Spring in 2011 through Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, since uh, 2011 and these grassroots participatory mobilizing force of social media media in Tunisia and Libya and Egypt in Yemen and Syria you know it for the first time helped to spread information and knowledge unhindered in virtual space there were no barriers knowledge management now no longer was a designable and controllable distributing of knowledge but now it implied largely unhindered and uncontrollable or hardly a difficult controllable sharing of knowledge, at least in the beginning. So social network coll collaborations started, co-learning uh, groups. Uh, they disrupted previous channels of exchange and opened up global opportunities for knowledge sharing in a true sense. So um, we have tools that develop uh, in this phase like collaborative indexing, social tagging, instant messaging, collaborative writing, mashups, web forums, name it. You, you know these concepts, we work with them today even, wikis, jives and so on. 
And uh, I remember Leif Edvinson, uh, I think we were in a meeting in Brussels uh, with the uh, Union, European Union, and um, Leif Edvinson said to me, he came to the conclusion that intellectual capital was no longer located between the ears, but much more is created between minds in the context of people's interaction process. And here we have exactly what Barney says with causal ambiguity. Through interaction, you develop core competencies in organizations, which help you to go into a clearly focused strategic direction. So these developments also had severe consequences for management in many organizations. This was new. I mean, they remember uh, top management representatives who uh, really had different hard problems in the Lopez period with knowledge now sharing and transcending corporate boundaries and it freed itself from organizational control. So large companies with strict information security standards were confronted with interactive practices that were really difficult to control. So we had expert communities, we had work out louds that developed in large automotive suppliers with OEMs. And this was a global communication network development and it felt, in, and, and many people felt increasingly lost with their confidentiality policies in organizations. So maybe the most important thing that developed here was that hierarchies, power, and professional authority became less and less important in knowledge development and knowledge sharing process. And Cisco, uh, here in this slide, you see uh, this, this little picture, they coined uh, the phrase, which I like very much, from hierarchies to wirekeys, to focus on the network-based organization. So here is self-organization, knowledge sharing comes into the picture, and they become a new important target of knowledge management. And this was not only taking place inside of organizations, between organizations, but this was taking place in the internet, in future centers, in learning labs, in dialogue houses, in connect, uh, context, uh, uh, continental, for example, or work out louds and so on. So we have many examples. Um, Han Kunen and um, uh, Simon Dickert were persons who very much promoted this, these developments here with new channels and uh, developing this new openness. And this new openness not only challenged traditional power-centered forms of dealing with knowledge, but it also had a democratic effect on the institutional world, I think. So the availability of information and knowledge were no longer the exclusive pri privilege of those with authority in organizational hierarchies. So to come to a facet uh, here, successful knowledge management, it became increasingly clear, only works on a participatory basis, on an eye level with people. And uh, traditional structures and hierarchies become increasingly dysfunctional. And that's probably why uh, also Gary Hamel in uh, 2012 announced uh, his hackathon and called for reinventing management. He said that we have so many old principles of management and they are no longer effective. I use these charts in the beginning of my introduction to management uh, in the university. And because these old concepts of management are based in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s of the last century. And um, this is no longer valid. It doesn't work anymore for uh, today's companies uh, in a high degree. And Simon Dückert uh, from Cognion took up this concept in Germany in podcasts and in his MOOC that he developed, Management 2.0, uh, where he tried to uh, develop a discussion in Germany on how can we develop tools and concepts and perspectives uh, of new learning and uh, trying to develop new management concepts. So even if the resulting visions of this new management 2.0 from his hackathon uh, largely still seem utopian in the majority of today's companies, a culture change can be observed clearly and not least through a generational change in, in companies which supports the implementation of sustainable knowledge management and transparency more than ever. So we can jump into the sixth phase, which I like to uh, label with dig digitalization, cognitive computing, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence and social innovation. Now, I think in this phase, we can observe two trends, two major trends, of course. 
There are many trends, uh, but uh, two major trends which I'd like to distinguish. It seems that KM is not only used as a means to boost business performance, as an instrument to increase organizational performance or uh, performance of, of uh, institutions. We now witness a level where we have a monetization of knowledge itself to a very high degree. So the business strategies themselves are now becoming knowledge services, be it, for example, data from machine sensors uh, in the context of predictive maintenance, or be it data from health monitoring, real-time health monitoring, or data from mobile and social media, media applications on people's behavior, cons consumption patterns, and so on. With more than 5.0 billion mobile phones out there, we have completely new opportunities for identifying and using metadata, um, which are currently emerging. So we see concepts of business, new business concepts, uh, IBM uh, coined a system of insights, you know, where you have insights derived from networking of people and networking of machines. And then you put things together, you do develop on the basis of of stored uh, data, you develop new systems of insight, which are new business uh, concepts or which result in new business concepts. And uh, we also, especially in Germany, very prominent, we have the concepts of Internet of Things with the Industry 4.0, the smart factories which are being networked or which are being connected. Not so much the people, but the machines here. So basically, this shows that the intangible resource knowledge or smart data, as we call them, can be monetized at a breathtaking speed, B2B or B2C, uh, uh, with completely new business models in uh, finance, in fashion, environment, in education, healthcare, and so on. The knowledge here is becoming the key driver of a value creation process itself. So with this type of knowledge extraction from big data, from data mining, from big data, from smart data, and the the condensation of these smart data with algorithms, especially here with cognitive computing, because we have expert schemes that are being are underlying the uh, the machine learning processes uh, in an enormous uh, speed, and now with this cognitive computing based on expert models, we have new domains of power developing and influencing. Uh, the uh, the whole discussion and the development of um, knowledge uh, distribution in, uh, in societies. And we do, and this is maybe the most important uh, thing, we do not need consent from people delivering the data. Every time you press on a cookie, you know, in, in uh, going through the internet, doing research, uh, you're giving consent and you're not really, you don't know what you're, what you're giving. Uh, away, what type of knowledge, what type of information, and for what you're giving it away. So we now see the application of expert models with high computing powers that use mental models of experience from, from experts or from cognitive an analysis schemes. And these are continuously being refined on a meta level and collecting, being collected and interpreted. So starting off with Watson, who basically showed us that search uh, for diseases, therapies, uh, investment decisions, or menus, or best HR practices can increasingly be developed by uh, individual uh, experts uh, on the basis of uh, big data, uh, big data retrieval. And coming back to the important point here on this development, we see that the core principle of sharing knowledge remains as before. It's all about sharing knowledge. But there's a very, very crucial difference now because sharing is no longer subject only to a voluntary decision of the individual, but is in part involuntary and covered. And here we're touching a huge new problem with regard to the origin of data, with the question of ownership of and rights of data, and especially of the resulting algorithms from these data. Okay, the second point I'd like to take put forward is the uh, um, knowledge management development for societal innovations and sustainability. We see here that alongside the monetization rational of algorithms in the business world, a culture of sharing through trust and collaborative learning with the goal of sustainability and social innovation seems to emerge. Now, I don't know to which degree it's emerging, but we see a number of initiatives, uh, not at least the 
UN sustainability goals. But we see, especially in connection with knowledge management, for example, the Knowledge for Development Partnership from Andreas Brandner and others, we see many areas where knowledge is being used in order to proceed towards societal development. Now, new patterns of aspiration and values of a younger generation come in here, Generation X, Y, Z, they grow louder. And for many, a return on investment as an end in itself is becoming uh, less important with the negative external effects that we're witnessing in climate and health problems. And this is increasing, dramatically increasing at the moment. And this is also partly reflected uh, already in the Horizon program from the EU, where you had to apply and you were asked to position yourself with regard to responsible research. So responsible research and innovation is becoming a very clear focus and at least we have the possibility that sustainability, social innovation and equality that go beyond mere social uh, corporate social responsibility in marketing is gaining in importance. So innovatively, the question arises here as to the interest in which knowledge management technologies and information process capacities are used. Thus, knowledge management, in addition to its technical dimension here, clearly takes on an ethical, a moral and a legal implication. So I think this is very important in the sixth phase. And this was a history, at least the historical phases I'd like to distinguish. So uh, we're now jumping into the present. And we made a, a, a test, Stefanie Tietz, who was working on this uh, in her PhD. She made a bibliometric overview just to see what's going on in knowledge management now in the present. So um, here we can see in a bibliometric analysis that she has been working on. Um, and she carried this out on the basis of articles published in the last five years in the uh, most well-known list of 28 academic journals, uh, which was based on Serenko and Bontis in 2021. Those are the most prominent journals with the highest impacts. And uh, she took the last five years of publications on knowledge management. And from this bibliometric um, analysis, we see um, a picture which is based on the VOS uh, viewer and the method is sort of bibliographic coupling and cross citation connections that are being used. But basically we see that uh, if we look uh, at the large picture, we see uh, five clusters coming up. Uh, we see a cluster or developing a cluster of knowledge sharing, which is a very traditional cluster, but a lot is centered around this knowledge sharing perspective. And this involves knowledge management systems, information management, and so on. And we see a blue cluster, which is centered largely around um, human resource management. It's sort of people's oriented leadership and tacit knowledge oriented. Then we see a red cluster, which uh, is based around intellectual capital, uh, higher education, uh, social networking. We see a green cluster, which is uh, clustered around innovation and knowledge transfer activities. And we see a purple cluster, which is clustered around organizational learning, <laughs> managers, trust, and knowledge hiding. So I won't comment this very much. It's sort of uh, the picture of what is going on in, publi in publication in top uh, KM journals between 2016 and 2021. Now, what is evolving new in this picture are three topics. Of course, we have publications coming up uh, with COVID-19. We have the whole uh, cluster of big data coming up, connecting with many of the other clusters. And we have the cluster, of course, of climate change. And this confirms largely the big picture that we've been uh, drawing and looking in phase four. So now time running out with time running out, Quickly, uh, let's look into uh, the future or try to look into future. It's always a big risk looking into the future because nothing is more uncertain than the future, especially nowadays. And we started off with this bracket in the beginning. So I'd like to emphasize uh, four fields, which in my view might be of large importance or might become more important in the domain of knowledge management. One is uh, starting off from the last observation with the societal development, with knowledge management for societal development, we see that we have a 
large knowledge divide developing in our uh, societies. This is not a new, uh, not a new discussion. We've had this discussion for quite some time, but now we're having a disparity on a global level, which knowledge power is moving to a new level. Uh, so, in other words, we can see we're facing an old dilemma here with the knowledge disparity, but now in a global context. The question here is, in whose interest will information and knowledge be derived from the data? So, is it the hyperscalers, Googles and Apples of this world, uh, who by means of jointly developing uh, algorithms now decode the DNA of societal knowledge and behavior from globally available data and use it for their corporate goals, you know, causes for disease or behavioral predictions and so on? Or is it knowledge management and intellectual capital management also, unlike before, in the service of sustainable goals and societal coexistence? I think these are two questions which are very important to deal with. And uh, we have to be aware that uh, this knowledge disparity is not exploding and, and increasing dramatically. So it's a very, very fine line and difficult line to ensure on one hand the protection of intellectual property on the one hand and to have common or open source on the other hand and to put I artificial intelligence filtered exploding knowledge at the service of the common good on the other. So uh, if we just look at chat GPT or if we look at uh, Med Palm, this is, uh, these are large language models and uh, we can derive knowledge uh, for a decision-making process in medicine, for example, one important area which we're working on at the moment. So possible frameworks here in this societal development is clearly the EU United Nations SDGs or the LE Index from Lifelong Learning um, that uh, were developed by Jacques Delors. But let's jump on uh, the second area or a focus field, as I call them, in knowledge management, I think uh, are crisis disaster management questions. So we have um, accidents in chemical uh, factories um, and we have uh, hurricanes, pandemia, natural disasters, terror attacks, fires and floodings with the um, climate change going on. And all of these call for high performance interventions. And here, according to our past research, we see that knowledge management can offer vital solutions for much, much better performance. So if we go into the field of disaster management, uh, we've been doing this for over 12 years now. We've conducted research there and it proves that knowledge management is a crucial factor in the performance and success of disaster and crisis management. And we have much experiment, uh, experimental evidence for this. So we've analyzed um, aviation accidents, uh, chemical industry accidents and so on. And you can see that here the knowledge diffusion and also the knowledge um, interpretation capabilities of people working in the periphery of these systems is crucial of crucial importance. So uh, basically in these dynamic, highly dynamic and turbulent fields uh, where we have unclear defined situations, we have quickly moving targets, uh, the traditional command control chains don't work the same work they, they, they worked before. So here we need decentralized organizational, self-organizational principles, and we need necessary resilience of the systems, which can only be provided by the diffusion of knowledge. And diffusion and access to knowledge are really important in these concepts. And here we have to better understand how professional knowledge management is working in fighting and crisis uh, disaster. But sadly enough, there's a second domain closely connected here, and that is the use of knowledge management in military intelligence. We see here a book from uh, David Tavell, Transforming Core Function of Military Intelligence to Knowledge Management. And uh, this becomes very relevant and is closely connected to crisis management and fighting in, in the battlefield and military intelligence. Here, I mean, knowledge has always been uh, crucial in warfare. But knowledge management here is increasingly seen as a main source of advantage in military intelligence and mission command success on the battlefield. So uh, sense making, problem solving and decision making are more complex and more essential in military situations as ever before. So there is a uh, we, we see this uh, the, if you do research in Canadian military journals and other contexts also connected with the Ukraine war now. 
We see it's all about learning while fighting. It's about creating shared understanding through co collaboration. It's about interoperational ability. It's about knowledge superiority and about quick diffusion of knowledge. So next focus, field that I think is going to increase in importance as the area of knowledge management in healthcare. So there is a very evident point why this topic is becoming of importance or is becoming more important. One, medical knowledge is crucial for health and healing. It's important to all of us worldwide. And there's a big dilemma. Knowledge is exploding on one side, but is not being made or is not being made proper use of. This is basically the dilemma and the problem. So what is the situation, the evidence? We see that um, medical knowledge increases exponentially. It doubles every 73 days. And this can be seen in, clearly in evidence in, in, study, in studies. This means that students of medicine who started their studies in 2010, they uh, will experience a doubling of medical knowledge three times before they finish. So this is the one side of the coin. And that's good. I mean, a lot of knowledge about diseases, about, about uh, diagnosis and about therapies. But on the other hand, we see that our systems are not able to cope with this uh, knowledge. And a profound empirical study has revealed that it takes up to an average, not up to, sorry, average 17 years for new knowledge from clinical trials to be applied in practice. And in Germany, it takes around 10 years for new research findings to reach patients in Germany. So this growing gap is especially critical in ambulatory healthcare, sort of the last, the last element in the, in, the, in the chain of the, of the health system. So this is a real big problem, the gap between developing knowledge and use of knowledge. And here I think knowledge management is of crucial importance. And um, without going into detail, because this carries me away, is I think it's such an important issue. Uh, we've been starting working on projects, uh, knowledge management in medicine and uh, developing uh, tools, concepts and improving knowledge management in healthcare, especially in the ambulatory area, where there's hardly any sort of diffusion of knowledge coming down to this last area in the knowledge and the health uh, care system. And finally, the fourth uh, topic which I would like to see important, uh, maybe it will become more important, hopefully, is the question, uh, I think there's a fantastic windows of opportunity to introduce knowledge management into a larger business environment that has been very reserved to the question of knowledge management in the past. And that is the international standard, the ISO 3401, which was written and uh, which was published in, in 2000, 2018. And in 40 years of research on knowledge management, I have painfully missed a basic common conceptual framework to integrate evidence and to derive new questions from. And this could prove to be a very interesting window of opportunity. And the purpose of the ISO 3401 is to support organizations to develop a management system that effectively promotes and enables value creation through knowledge. And this can be broken down. For example, we've been working with the ISO spec, with the spec, uh, with the German Dean Institute, how this can be broken down for small and medium sized companies. Um, Gabriele Falma was also involved in this project uh, with many others. Um, and this is a large window of opportunity because it creates a common language for a very multidisciplinary field with contributions from philosophy, psychology, uh, and many others. So we have to provide evidence based for this in these models and help to diffuse and introduce these models. At least the EC, ESO 3401 can be a door opener or maybe a Trojan horse in organizations in areas that have been very little interested in knowledge management so far. So let's get them into the boat. Let's use the historical chance in an economy that fancies uh, certifications and uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. This is the end of my presentation today. So I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Peter. I'm a bit breathless. 
Uh, this was a very intense uh, live session, and I'm a bit in trouble now also uh, looking at our um, schedule. We are already a bit over time. So, Lena, you have been the first one. Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for such explicit, such rich presentation of the timeline of, of the research on the, and practices on knowledge management. My question was, uh, if there is any uh, publication on this, I see the book uh, on the screen, which you show right now. Is it in English or is it, it is in German? Just to read more about what was presented, about the research you introduced and so on. Uh, is, is there any other publications, if it's in German, you know, to, to share with students, to read more and to, to find out more, more insights? Well, Linda, thank you very much for your response. I appreciate that very much, uh, your feedback. Uh, I'm so sorry. It's just a German book and I just wanted to promote it a little bit, you know, in the German community. But it, of course, it covers these areas, but it does not give a thorough uh, historical development overview. So it's uh, basically these uh, MOOCs here and a keynote I held at Coventry uh, in the conference, Knowledge Management Conference. But otherwise, I think this, yeah, this is it at the moment. So, but if you uh, would like to know some more details about certain phase, about certain publications, I'd be more than happy to provide you uh, with these. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You have a question. My question was if the change of the aim of uh, knowledge management changed by the aim of what success is seen as, so what is seen as success. So in former times it was like just the company has to earn a lot of money, has to like uh, kick every competitor out of the competition and so on. And now we have a different point, different view on success. Is it like connected? That's so that's what I thought it is. But what do you think? <clears throat> Thank you, Julia, for your question. Uh, let me please just add one point to the question of Lena uh, before, because uh, indeed there is no publication up to this point, but together with Christina Melchuk, we're developing at the moment, um, you know, the history map of uh, the German Society for Knowledge Development. And in a joint little project, we're developing sort of this map and putting it into the, embedding it into the historical context um, of knowledge management as general. So we're working on these maps together and hopefully um, um, Andreas will be able to present this uh, in, in, Oct in September, October uh, and use it sort of as a discussion uh, forum because I think it's important to discuss about this. It's nothing that is sort of uh, objective or final. It's something, it's a living thing we have to discuss jointly in the community. What do we see as important? What do we see at the constant, at the situation at the moment as relevant for knowledge management? So I'd just like to add this because I think this is an important uh, addition and so not a fixed publication and something that we jointly can do. So I would be happy to do that. So I'd like to uh, go into the question from Julia. You said um, the question is, um, has how have the aims, if I've uh, understood you correctly, have the aims or the goals of knowledge management changed? Uh, I think, <clears throat> yes, indeed, it, the goals of knowledge management always depend on the people using the knowledge management. It's the same as with every instrument we have in our society, be it technical or be it a service instrument. And it's always in before, I think it was much more focused and centered around business success. And I've tried to um, make it clear or try to, to uh, explain that I think the, the um, possible spectrum of goals that you can use knowledgement for has widened enormously. And I think especially societal questions and not only business success, as a, as a goal uh, are important, but sort of common goods and, and societal questions are of uh, basic importance. So it has broadened indeed, and it's in the, in the hands of the people using it. And I think uh, with the destruction of power structures in, in management and in business environments, um, I think this is also coming to the forefront that it always involves the question about what are the goals? What are we using it for? So I see it with my children, you probably observe it as well. They're saying, okay, I mean, it's not a question about just earning money, you know, working with a Google company, a Google daughter, um, um, and, and they are, for them, it's extremely important. What am I part of and what am I doing with this knowledge? So yes, just to give you a simple answer. 
So I see Leif uh, raising a hand. Is this uh, directly related to what Peter was saying or Julia's question? Yes, um, I think uh, what Peter has been presenting is brilliant. It's a really splendid overview and a, a big map for taking the next steps. And the next steps might be to uh, bridge with uh, Noboru Kono and uh, Japan and see how the sense-making dimensions is, might be leading up to the bar and beyond the bar. So I w I'm curious about your reflection on how does the culture of Asia impact what you have presented? And the final comment is that if there is no one else um, taking the step on, on presenting and translating the book or booklet, I think we should do it within the New Club of Paris community as a, uh, an online little booklet with this presentation. Thanks once again, uh, Leif. Um, yes, of course. I mean, the bridging between uh, these two cultures is a very crucial question. I, uh, as you know, I worked uh, together with um, the JAIS, the Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, and Professor Nonaka, Professor Boyozier, developing an international knowledge management master program. And to me, this, this cleavage between these two cultures was uh, amazing. Because, uh, you know, the point where we developed knowledge wasn't in the classroom in the Japanese classes uh, with master students. Uh, we developed knowledge by, first of all, uh, singing karaoke together and developing a joint mutual feeling for and trust with each other and then exchanging experiences and knowledges. And thereby, we sort of got into a flow that uh, opened up possibilities um, of uh, knowledge sharing in a much, much uh, more efficient way than we have with the further training programs in the Western countries. So I'm not saying anything new, you know all about that. But where I find that there is a nice bridge, an interesting cultural bridge, are the concepts of, of, uh, of David Bohm. I mean, David Bohm relates his dialogic uh, method to Zen Buddhistic uh, awareness concepts. And we've used this method in our master programs quite frequently, and it's a uh, bringing in people together in a group and telling them, okay, now we'll talk about a top topic. We'll talk about a subject. And you're not going to discuss this topic. We're going to hold a dialogue on it. And this is a, a very crucial difference because discussion from, from uh, Greek is destroying, is uh, you know winning. And dialogue is building upon, is, uh, is adding on. So this was amazing in, in these master classes because people said, Wow, this is a great feeling, not having to de defend one's own position, no, but rather detaching from your own position and, and joining in and building a joint picture before you start deciding on anything. So there, I think, uh, Peter Sanger has made a remarkable, uh, remarkable contribution because he introduced this concept of David Bohm with uh, Zen meditation awareness concepts into Western culture. Uh, with this dialogic uh, concept. And Ba, I spoke to Nonaka about it and I asked him, uh, have you been aware of the dialogue? Uh, yes, of course he knew it, but they never related each other in the literature. Peter Sanger with his helicopter view and Nonaka with his Ba concept. So I think this is really important because it's all about developing a culture of knowledge sharing. And um, then on this basis, defining goals, uh, Julia, uh, jointly and uh, going into one direction with this power of joint knowledge mental models. And we see it also in disaster management and crisis management. It's so extremely important to have joint mental models when you go out there uh, and uh, you take actions. Well, thank you for your question there. I don't know if I answered it, um, but... Well, uh, partially you did, but uh, I would like to amplify that what we see in the financial community right now is a kind of collapsing, uh, not monetizing approach. And that's why the um, Asian culture might help us to reach a deeper understanding of value creation. How could that be? I mean, do you have a, a certain bridge where, where we can go, go over and use this type of knowledge or insight? Yes, we have started to prototype and uh, Lina is a part of it. It's, we call it Oracy Lab. And it's done together with Hank Kuhn and, and some other people. Uh, but the idea is actually to go from uh, the pla practical application of oracy. Yes. Beyond literacy. Literacy and schooling and training 
is very much a focus on the literacy dimension. Now we need to take the oracy dimension into account as well. And that might be the first step of it. Thank you. Please uh, keep me updated on this. Uh, give me some information. I will be really interested in it. Thanks. So I think maybe this already goes a bit into your direction, Gunther. I saw that you have put two or three questions. I must admit, I'm a little bit hesitating because reading your questions, Gunther, you open, as Fontane would say, a very vital field. <laughs> so, but anyhow, to give you also the opportunity and maybe asking for a shorter um, answer and then maybe, uh, yeah, taking up the discussion in another forum, but up to you. Sure, Gilbert. sure. Well, uh, I already was in touch with Peter on the question if one of the new directions is uh, spirituality and indigenous knowledge uh, to be introduced as a methodological uh, new approach. Maybe you can comment on that. <laughs> well, I think uh, you could comment much better on this, Peter. <laughs> so I've been learning from you there. but. Um, well, the, the question, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit um, uh, careful with the, uh, with the term spiritual, spirituality, but um, uh, we would have to have a joint understanding of what it means. But uh, speaking about these concepts of uh, awareness, I think we're closely connected uh, with something we could call spirituality, uh, because it's a question of, uh, of ourselves in a certain environment. What, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? What is identity? And so we're coming very close to, to uh, these questions of spirituality, but not in a simplistic way that is sort of religion, uh, but it's a question of uh, dealing and reflecting on one's own identity with others and what our roles are. And I think this is quite an important thing. And it has something to do with values, with, uh, with the, effective, the affective dimension. I always remember um, Lutz von Rosenstiel, who was a, quite a well-known social psychologist in, um, in Germany, who died much too early. He was in Vienna, you know, he had a chair also later. And um, uh, he um, was a co-editor um, uh, co of many things uh, that we had been doing together, and he helped me a lot to understand things. He always asked me, Peter, uh, you're much too cognitive oriented. Question yourself about the effective dimension of knowledge and knowledge management. I think the whole question of knowledge management is, is missing this effective, this value dimension to a certain degree. And yeah, I think up today, this is a question that comes now with spirituality also comes into the picture. I don't know if this is what, how you see it, uh, Günther, or uh, what's your perception? I would be interested to, to hear your notion on this. Well, as Gabriel said, this is, uh, takes too much time to discuss it here. I was just reflecting to uh, the people, um, the colleagues at, uh, at the University of Economics in Vienna, uh, Kaiser and Kraguli, uh, where, which yeah. you discovered also as uh, input providers on this subject. But as said, uh, this goes too far. Okay, thank you very much, Anyone. <laughs> so then, thank you very much. Peter, thank you, all of you, for your contribution. So thank you a lot. Have a nice weekend and hope to see all of you in some context soon again. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank bye you bye. very much. Yeah. Feeling